Chef Amon. I'm the corporate chef with Maine. Thanks a lot for coming out here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, today, but now we have our third demo of the day. I don't know if you've got a theme so far, but you notice that we're doing a lot of scratch cooking and we're doing a lot of things to help make your restaurants set themselves apart from the competition. Uh, that's really what the point is. We're going to get into some crafting. Today we're going to talk about regat, making fresh regat, um, and also Chef Michael uh, Langdon here. Um, can I say where you're from? Sure. Okay. Uh, from uh, Glenmore Country Club down there in Pennsylvania. Also formerly, you might have seen him on uh, Hell's Kitchen. Is that right? Season 11. Season, season 11 of Hell's Kitchen. He's been kind enough to come back and do a demonstration and show us how he actually uses fresh ricotta in his restaurant. And then we're also going to raise a curd here with you today as well, show you exactly how easy it is to do. And then he's going to walk through all sorts of presentations afterwards. So without further ado, would you please help me welcome Chef Michael Langdon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. OK, so we're going to do a little bit of a demo. Oh, oh, is that you? Okay. I don't know. So we're going to do a little demonstration today. Uh, fresh ricotta cheese. We're going to do a few different uh, variations. We're going to do a soft, uh, a medium, and we're going to do a, a marinated age. We do this at the restaurant, and we utilize it for a lot of different applications, uh, sweet, savory. And uh, a lot of people get intimidated when you hear homemade cheese. And it's really very, very, very simple. It's only a few ingredients and a little bit of patience. Everything kind of, you know, works, works itself out in the pot. So first here, we have a softer variation of the ricotta. What I've done here is, when I, when I made this, uh, I steeped it with a little bit of lavender, uh, drained it, we whipped it with a little bit of honey. Now I'll use that for an application like a roasted beet salad. Uh, we'll use that for, you know, a variation of desserts, tiramisu, things of that nature. Uh, secondly, we have a marinated firm. I separated this, drained a lot of the moisture out, and we let this air dry and hang in cheesecloth for about four days. Third, we have the same technique here, but what I've done is I've infused this last one with some Italian seasoning, some, some Italian herbs, uh, thyme, rosemary, a little bit of garlic, things like that. And then we wrapped it in cheesecloth and hung it for a couple days, and we marinated it in a blend of extra virgin olive oil and blended oil. Um, I found that you know if you use extra virgin, if you use too much, it's going to coagulate, you know, in the in the cold. So in that oil, we've got uh, garlic confit, we've got rosemary, we've got some bay leaf, a little pinch of salt. Now I've let I made this about two weeks ago, so it's been sitting in the uh, the oil marinating for about two weeks. So it's going to kind of pull in all of those flavors. Uh, it's really, really nice. So what I'm doing here, basically, I, I've tried several different techniques to, to, to really nail this and get it right. I've used half and half. I've used heavy cream. I've used 2% milk. Uh, I found that I get the best yield from whole milk. Now, generally, when I do this, I'll use one gallon of whole milk. I'll use the juice of one lemon and two tablespoons of white wine vinegar, OK? Uh, I'll get just about a six pan yield, so it's nice, okay? So this is coming up uh, gently. Uh, I don't want it to, to come to a rolling boil. I like to go slow with this. Normally when I do it in the kitchen, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, because once it starts to separate, you know, some of it might stick to the bottom. If it starts to scorch, you're gonna have to start over. You know, you're gonna get that scorched taste in your cheese. So this is starting to come up, and I'm just gonna squeeze my lemon right in there. two tablespoons of white wine vinegar, and just a small pinch of salt, small pinch of salt. And literally, I'm just going to watch it. I'm just going to watch it. Uh, we're going to walk away from it. Now, as it goes, you're going to see that it's going to start to separate. The curd in the way is going to, you know, kind of separate. The curd is going to come up to the top, and you're going to be left, like, once you start moving it around, it's going to thicken. And what you'll, what you'll see is like a, like a very clear liquid. Uh, once, your, once your liquid underneath starts to turn clear, all your curd rises to the top, go ahead and take it out of there. Now, with something like this, I kind of uh, use the analogy like a risotto. You learn how to make a good risotto, you know, you learn the proper way to do it. 
all of a sudden you know how to make a million different risottos. You know, it's, it's up to your imagination. So with this, for, for the, uh, the Italian season, uh, the, uh, the vinegar that I use, I use white balsamic because, you know, my application is going to be a, a tomato and olive salad. So I want to impart a little bit of that balsamic flavor into the cheese, all right? Um, with these other two, like I previously mentioned, I just use white wine vinegar. Um, Jeff, to interrupt, if, if somebody wanted, you got me up? Uh, chef, if somebody wanted to, if they wanted to just use lemon juice, could they do that? You can just use lemon juice. You would okay. just have to up your ratio. For a gallon of milk, for a gallon of milk, I would probably use two to two and a half lemons for their juice. Okay. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. You could use that. You could use orange juice. Any, 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 anything acidic. You know. Nice. Um, so as you see, if you kind of take a close look, it's actually. Let me see if I could get some on the spoon here. It's actually starting to separate now, and it's starting to thicken up. And that's exactly what we want to happen. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm going to keep an eye on this. We don't want it to really start to uh, boil. Uh, if it does boil, it's not an emergency. Just turn it down. Let it let it work for you. I, sh I should I should mention again that uh, we're using this um, induction burner, and you've seen these things used before. It's pretty cool, uh, but this particular model right here, you can really drill down within five or ten degrees uh, Fahrenheit of where you want this to be. When you're making things like cheese and trying to raise up curds, yep. that kind of accuracy really really goes a long way. And plus, you don't you don't have to necessarily stick a dirty thermometer or may have been sanitized, may not have been sanitized. We want to make cheese. We don't want to grow things necessarily. Right. So exactly. Um, uh, but this one, you can get more information on it at the Volrath booth right on the end of this line. This is starting to look pretty good. Absolutely. You know, and I I have a little bit of experience with induction burners. I'm used to the traditional you know gas flame, just like a lot of people. Uh, so I'm especially keeping an eye on this. I'm, I'm kind of watching the movement in there. And as we go, you can see just how fast. I mean, I, I added the, uh, the vinegar and the lemon juice less than 10 minutes ago, and I'm already getting like some nice whey in there. You know, so it's really, it's really that easy. Um, we do this, at, like I said, we do this at the restaurant all the time. So with that being said, um, I just want to slide over to talk about this soft cheese for a second. Uh, when doing this, Moisture content plays a big part in, you know, your, your end result, what your application is going to be. Uh, you know, for like, say, a cannoli filling or, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like a roasted beet salad with some, some pickled red onions and spiced pecans. You know, I want this to be a little wet, all right? I want it to be almost spreadable, okay? Uh, you know, when you're making a dessert, you want to be able to, to pipe it, we'll say. So after I separated this, I let it drain for a little bit. Uh, maybe only 20 minutes, a half hour. I still want to like leave some of that moisture in there. So what I did after that, I transferred this to a KitchenAid mixer and I used my paddle attachment. All right, from there, a little bit of salt, a little bit of honey, and I just want to whip it, kind of whip all those ingredients in. You know, it's going to kind of smooth it out a little bit. It's going to be really, really, really nice. For the second application, um, basically, I skipped the process of whipping it in the, uh, the KitchenAid, same for this, and I manually kind of squeeze and press a lot of the moisture out. Uh, then I want to let it hang. And, and, you know, three, four days, get a lot of that moisture out. So from there, let me just check this. I don't know if you could see this. You could see here in the pot, if I move some of the, uh, the curd out of the way, it's really starting to clear in the center here. And that's what we're looking for. Everything's starting to do its job. You know, we're starting to snap this. And everything nice is rising to the top. Now, Chef, you use the term snap. Is that really the kind of the separation of the, uh, the curd and the whey, so that to is, speak? That all. is. We, so snap we, is like a little Bo Peep sort of thing? Absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. Cool. You know, just some kitchen slang. You know, we want to snap it uh, or, you know, separate the curd from the whey. Uh, basically, just... Almost like it looks like a consomme clarification. Break the emulsion, if you will. There you go. You know? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of times we don't want things to separate in the kitchen, but in this instance, this is exactly what we're looking for. This would for. be a very bad looking sauce. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it would be. Consomme, we'd be, we'd be right on Bing, track. Bingo. We'd be right on track. So <clears throat> that's starting to work for us. So what I want to do is. If you want to, I can, we can actually dump that. You want to throw that into the larger container. Yeah, we can do that. So I'll clear this out of the way for you. Right. And then we can drain it in there after. Okay. All right. So 
we're right where we need to be with this. So basically, I am just going to filter this through. Now, I like to use a fine mesh shiv or a, a chinois because I find all the liquid will pass through, but we'll kind of keep all of the solid and it'll minimize any of the waste. You know, we'll look in the bottom of this and we won't have any of the curd in the bottom. It'll all stay right in the top. So as you see, it's starting to drain. All that liquid's coming right through. All our cheese is gonna stay right in the top. Normally when I'm making the softer variation, I look for like a very minimal drip. You know, once, once I don't see a drip coming through at all, I'll transfer it to a sheet tray. I won't refrigerate it. I'll let it come down to room temperature. Then I'll mix it in, then I'll mix it in the KitchenAid with the paddle. If it gets cold, it's gonna stiffen up and get firm. So I wanna whip it first with, you know, whatever ingredients I'm gonna use, and then take it from there. All right, so. And if we want to, I can pass that around. I can actually pass it around so people can see it. Yeah. Because we're not going to work, we're not going to work with it, right? Oh, yeah, go for it. All right. Just All right. so happens that we've got some, uh, <clears throat> I managed to work over Roland. They're actually carrying Fleur de Sel now. They have truffle salt. They have all sorts of different salts now, um, which I know Chef and I, we get a little geeky on salt. Oh, um, yeah. But this one's Fleur de Sel. It's one of, the, uh, one of the better ones I've seen available now commercially, so we're happy to use it. Absolutely. And that's going gonna, gonna to be in my breakfast tomorrow. Yeah, you can't beat it. As far as salt goes, I mean, the, the sky's the world. I probably have at least 10 or 12 different variations of salt in my kitchen for various applications. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So see how this is just barely dripping through? So that's basically it. I mean, cool. that's homemade ricotta cheese, you know? Um, from there, second. you can season it, do whatever you like with it. I'm going to pass this around so everybody can check it out. All right. All right, with that being said, I'll just show you a couple of the different, you know, applications we use this for at the restaurant. Um, I'll start off with the marinated. All right, now, like I said earlier, we have uh, some Italian herbs in here. We have some thyme, we have some rosemary. Okay. Uh, confit garlic, bay leaves, and we've marinated this cheese in extra virgin olive oil and blended oil for about two weeks. So we're going to get some nice flavor with that. Uh, so with that, I'd like to do just like a tomato and olive salad. Something nice and simple. Just a few ingredients. You know, if I'm going to go through the trouble of making a, a homemade cheese, which as you can see is really not that much trouble at all, you know, I want it to stand out. Like I want to highlight it. I don't want to put too much on the plate and, and bury it and have it get lost. You know, so we want to highlight it. So basically, you'll see how it just kind of crumbles down out of the cheesecloth. All right, you'll think uh, maybe like almost like a feta, like a feta cheese, okay? So I'm just gonna lay some of this down. And this is nice too, you know, once summer hits and tomatoes come in season and you know, we, we start getting all these beautiful variations of nice heirloom tomatoes and yellow tomatoes. This is a lot of fun, you know, it's great for a summer menu. For this particular salad, I'm just going to use some grape tomatoes just to pair it with the cheese a little bit. And then I made a, an olive tapenade. I used Kalamata olives and Niswa olives, a little caper, some lemon juice, a little bit of salt, fresh parsley. Just kind of place that there. A little bit here. All right. We have some nice baby arugula here. You're going to get some, some bitterness from this. It's going to pair up really nicely with everything. So just kind of lay that across. And then I'll finish this with a little more extra virgin olive oil. I brought some aged balsamic vinegar for a little bit of sweetness and acidity to cut through the brine of the olives and the, and the salt. I'm sorry, I had to take, I couldn't resist taking a picture of Michael plating up here. 
as we all know, if it's not on Twitter or Facebook, it didn't happen. Exactly. So there you go. Exactly. You know, where would we be without social media today? Okay. Probably be nice and relaxed. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right. So that's just uh, one simple application. All right. So we have our, our marinated ricotta cheese, baby arugula. Very classic flavors, you know, but instead of buying the, the, the ricotta and flavoring it yourself, you're taking, I mean, you saw how long that took. You're taking 20 minutes, a little bit of love, and that's what's going to make you stand out from everybody else. You know, you're going you're gonna to do that homemade application yourself. You know, you're going to provide that to your guests. You know, and they're going to be really excited for that. And, right. that's, and that's really the whole point. You know, the, the theme of our entire food show is about uh, the basics done better. Yes, I mean, could we have bought up a ricotta? And Absolutely. we sell perfectly good ricotta, but you know what? If you have the time or you're looking someplace to actually create a signature for your own restaurant and set yourselves apart, it doesn't have to be the whole menu. Just one or two things a little bit at a time, and then you have to make sure that you communicate what you're doing to your guests, whether it be through social media or your presence in the dining room. That's how you're going to start to really define your brand and set yourself aside. Let's face it, the big guys, they do what they do well, right? Us independents, we have to do what we do well. And these little steps, these little pain in the butt sort of things that go that extra mile, that's what's going to set us apart. That's what's going to ensure our future here, all right? Absolutely. As independent restaurants, absolutely. absolutely. And the thing is, you know, just to kind of talk about what you said, myself coming from a country club, you know, background, the volume that we do is, is intense. You know, it's, it's, it's very busy. You know, and, and just like any other restaurant, we have to watch our overhead, we have to watch our labor, things of that nature. Um, you know, so any time that we get to have a, a homemade application for a dessert or a savory you know, entree or appetizer, it's, it's something special. And the membership sees it, the guests see it, you know, and then you know, our staff out front, you know, they get to talk about the fact that it's, it's made in house. You know, and people get really excited about that. Okay, so next I'm going to do, this is going to be a, a sweet application or a dessert application. All right, so I have this honey lavender ricotta cheese that we made. Now this is super fresh. I ju just got made yesterday. Okay, so what I want to do, I'm just going to take a little bit of this. And it's really, really soft. Now if you left the honey out and you left the lavender out and you seasoned it differently, you could add this and make like a killer lasagna with it. It would be amazing, you know? So there's applications for it all. So I'm going to quenelle this. I'm going to set it right in the middle, all right? Because we want that to be kind of the star of the show, all right? Now, what I brought with me is a little bit of pound cake. We're just going to kind of cut this down. This is Maine's pound cake. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what we do, I mean, a lot of times in the, in, in the restaurant, uh, you know, we'll buy a pastry shell or we'll buy a pound cake as our base, and yep. then we'll make by hand or homemade, you know, three or four different applica yeah, applications for it. You know, so it's the best of both worlds. We're giving the, we're giving the membership something that's fairly homemade, you know? Yep. All right, so we have that. Hey, folks, I should mention, if anybody wants more information about this stuff, some of the recipes, some of the techniques, and definitely the products that go into what we're doing, Take your name tag or enter your little PIN number that you have on your customer tag right into this iPad right here. That'll generate us to a message to make sure that we know to follow up with you and get you that information. Whether it's next week, a month from now, or a year from now, we're going to keep this information for you so when the time is right and you're ready to play around with regatta in your kitchen, you'll be ready to do it, okay? Yeah, and if you have any questions, just you know, yep. hit and me up on Facebook. Or just hit up <laughs> Michael on Facebook. Also, this is going to be here, so you can do this for the entirety of this show. If you forget to do it tonight, you can do it tomorrow. What you got there, Chef? All right, so basically what I'm doing, um, like I said earlier, I want to highlight the ricotta cheese. Um, you know, so there's a fat Thank content you. to it. Uh, so, I, you know, just like with a savory item, uh, when, I, when I work with desserts, I want there to be a nice balance of acidity, sweetness. I'll even use <clears throat> different salts. Uh, in a lot of my desserts just to kind of keep that balance. So what I've done here, I've got this honey lavender ricotta right in the center. All right, like I said earlier, that's the star of the show. Fresh berries are coming in the season. Why not highlight them? You know, a lot of times if something's, you know, top notch, you don't really have to do uh, that much to it. We get great strawberries in, eat a great strawberry. 
Just let it be a strawberry. Um, I've so made a couple different uh, gels here. Uh, I've got mango gel and I've got an orange gel. So we're going to add a little bit of acidity to the dessert in that aspect. I'm just going to kind of pop that in there. So chef, when you say gels, you, what you've done is you've actually used different thickening agents and introduced them to liquids. I have. At certain I have. stages. I have. Uh, at the restaurant, we used a little bit of, uh, you know, I guess molecular gastronomy. Um, you know, some people are into it. Uh, we, we, use, we use it a little bit here and there. Uh, basically what I'll do, I'll make a simple syrup. I'll implement whatever flavor I'm going to use to that. I'll be it orange, strawberry, things of that nature. Uh, and then we'll set it with agar agar, okay. which is found in kelp, uh, you know, or like or red seaweed. Yeah. It's a thickening agent. Uh, what's unique about it is it'll take the heat. So you could you know, in theory, basically you could make a, a noodle out of uh, tomato juice and you could serve it warm, but it'll, it'll keep its shape. Uh, for this application, we use a little bit less of the agar uh, okay. because we want it, we don't want it to be firm. We want it to be loose like a gel, like think grape jelly, gotcha. something as simple as that. Cool. All right. Normally what we'll do, I'll, I'll have it in squeeze bottles and we'll, we'll have a little bit of fun. And yeah, I've seen you know. those pictures on Facebook. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we'll do that. Um, so. I'll just finish this with a little bit of fresh mint. Now, Chef talks about, uh, he was talking about molecular gastronomy. Maybe next year we'll start getting into a little bit of it. We're still out here, and it's, but it's still popular. Um, sometimes people don't know where to put or where to start to play around with molecular gastronomy. The nice thing about dessert courses is it's kind of like you throw away the rule book and, and you can play around with desserts and have fun with it because it's kind of hard. It's, it's a great risk-free environment to experiment with molecular gastronomy, right. especially if it's just as simple as using something like agar agar. Absolutely. You know, and not a lot of places, you know, really specialize in molecular gastronomy. So a lot of the things that I've learned over the years have been through, you know, trial and error. Um, one of the biggest things that I really kind of implement on my kitchen staff, you know, we don't fail. Uh, we learn or we succeed. You know, you it's go. all about staying positive. Great attitude. It's all about having a good attitude. You know, we're going to make mistakes, but that's how we all learn. You know, I've burned a lot of sauce in my day to learn how to make a good <laughs> one. You know, unfortunately, but that's 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 how it is. I made a burnt blanc before I made a burr blanc. Exactly. So there you exactly. go. So here's the finished plating of the dessert. Pretty, uh, right? You know, we have a honey lavender ricotta, pound cake, fresh berries, and citrus. A little fresh mint to finish. You know, that goes out to a table. It's nice and simple. Just a few ingredients. But there's homemade cheese on there. There's a love you know? in here. There's, 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 there's real love you know, in here. Yeah. You know, sometimes less is more. You know, so, so something like that is a lot of fun. But make sure you're telling the story back in your restaurants. If you are going through this extra effort, you have to communicate it to your customers. That can be through the service staff, that can be through social media, or it can be from the chef or whoever it is out there in the dining room talking about it. You know, sometimes I think when we introduce these type of things, yeah. you can't solely depend on marketing. Right. Sometimes for every two that you want to sell, you might have to give away one. But right. what are we talking about? But a little bit of milk, a strawberry, and a blueberry, and a little bit of seaweed extract. That's it. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the, the food cost on that is remarkably low. No. You know? And uh, one, one huge thing that I take a lot of pride in is our pre-meals with the staff. Anytime we come up with a new dish, a new technique, any kind of feature, uh, we always roll it out. In a, in a pre-meal setting. Um, I look at it as an investment. I don't look at it as a loss. You know, whether it's a piece of swordfish, a dessert, you know, a 14 ounce New York strip, to me that's an investment. If I roll that out, the staff gets to try it, they enjoy it, they're gonna wear that on their sleeve at the table. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna sell that dish with emotion. And you know, that's what it's all about. You know, just kind of keeping those good vibes going. You know, that's um, it. Thank you, everybody. Oh, it's my pleasure. You got it. My pleasure, Chef. Now I'm gonna walk around for anybody that might have some questions. I'm gonna go around with my fancy microphone. I'll be right down, Mr. The shelf life for the soft, for the soft, uh, probably about four to five days. So I really try to monitor our yield as opposed to how much we use. Now this will stay in the olive oil. That'll stay for at least a month. That'll stay for at least a month. And when I dry it like this, I wouldn't go over about 10 days. That's me personally. I just like to keep it rotated and keep it, you know, fresh. But 
The oil will preserve it. You know, nothing is getting in there. Just so everybody understands, the question on the floor was, how long does a ricotta keep? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the lavender and honey, how did you infuse that flavor into there? Okay. For the lavender and the honey, basically what I'll do, what, what you saw here, all right, when you have the milk, the lemon juice, a little bit of vinegar, I'll take a, a, a couple stems of fresh lavender and I'll put it right in there. As it comes up to temperature, it's going to perfume the milk before it separates, so it'll, it will impart the, the flavor. After that, once I sep uh, strain it, rather, like I did with the, in the mesh, I'll pull the lavender out. From there, I'll put it in a, a, you know, a KitchenAid mixer with a paddle attachment, a little pinch of salt, a little bit of honey to your seasoning, depending on how sweet or how unsweet you want it, and then I'll whip the honey in, in, in that manner. So essentially, any idea that you have, if you want to uh, um, uh, you know, constitute any flavor in there, whether it's rosemary, thyme, you know, uh, any kind of like fruit, anything like that, I'll usually add it to the, to, the, to the milk itself while I'm bringing it up to temp so those flavors steep in it. And it, it turns out really, really nice. Yeah, awesome question. More questions for Chef Michael. Are we allowed to ask you anything? Sure. <laughs> I'm an open book. Are you, are you allowed to talk about Hell's Kitchen yet or no? I think my, con yeah, I think my <laughs> contract's up. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, if anybody has any questions, though, please, great opportunity here because we want you to get engaged with Chef Michael. If not. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> that, show's, that, that, that show's hard to talk about. Thank you, Chef Michael. Thank you very much for oh, coming out pleasure. and helping me. We appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have Thank a you nice everybody. I appreciate it.